Let's talk about love bombs and truth bombs. So when you're getting love bombed, that means what happens at the beginning of a relationship where, you know, there's this outpouring of devotion, especially early in a relationship or after a relationship conflict or something like that has happened. It can be the start of something, what, what feels like something wonderful, right? And what could be wrong with your partner laying it on so thick, right? I mean, isn't that part of a great relationship? So love bombing refers to these loving words, these actions and behaviors, but the problem is that they're being used as a manipulation and they, they offer this attention and this loving and, and affection in an attempt to influence another person. And that's what love bombing is. So a narcissist love bombs in order to gain your trust. But once the bombing raid has ended, the affectionate behavior starts to dry up. So the love bomber at that, pers at that point might become irritable. Um, they start to dominate you. They start to not have boundaries. They might even start ghosting you. And if you want to know more about ghosting, you should definitely check out my video on silent treatment versus ghosting um, versus going no contact. Because I give a whole... Um, primer on what the difference is between those things. But, you know, love bombing is something that happens because they, um, they, 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 they want your, um, they, they want control over you. So with love bombing, you know, they are, they sometimes use it after the relationship starts as a methodology to, um, get you to not see their poor behavior so that they could be excused from something, um, because they don't want to have to take responsibility for something. So they use love bombing sometimes in that, um, way too. It's just just, it's a, it's, it's not constant and it's really a manipulation and when it's on, it's on and it's great, but when it ends, it's awful. It's, it's way worse. So they, they don't even necessarily believe their own professions of, of devotion and commitment and all of that. Um, their sincerity does not determine um, whether love bombing is taking place or not. Love bombing describes an imbalanced relationship. It's one in which the one person is the recipient of the love bombing and the other person is, you know, actually just trying to manipulate the other person. It's not an equal partnership where you're both invested, you're both expressing love, you're, it's a good give and take, and it's meaningful, and there's a, a real connection. That's not what's going on here. So it's, it's, it, a lot of times it's, it feels like pressure, um, especially at the beginning of the relationship where they're trying to fast track it. Um, and they, they'll, they might be pressuring at the beginning for exclusive dating or for moving in together or sexual stuff or whatever, but you know, they're trying to fast, fast track that relationship in the beginning. So, and I actually have a whole video on love bombing as well. So you should definitely check out, um, my video on love bombing. Okay. So when you want to respond to those love bombs, then what, what do you do? So the response is what we call a truth bomb and a truth bomb is a fact spoken in a clear, easy to understand manner without bias, without emotion. It's a, a piece of knowledge that when told to the listener who happens to be the narcissist in this case, it's devastating to their argument and their view. So here are seven truth bombs that are in response to love bombs. So for example, if they say, I will never disappoint you again, I promise from now on, everything will be different. Your truth bomb is going to be, 
that sounds too good to be true. That's, you know, you're basically just saying, listen, that's a little too much. Nobody can be perfect. Nobody can respond with, I'll never do this ever again. Right? So you're just, you're saying it matter of factly without emotion, without like smugness, don't be sneering because they'll definitely respond in anger to that. Just say that sounds too good to be true. Okay. So the second one is they say, you're so special to me. You know, I didn't mean what I said. I wasn't myself. I won't take it out on you again. So then the truth bomb to that is I've heard that promise before. Okay. So if you are so sick of being love bombed and you are so ready to just truth bomb from now on, give me a truth bomb in the comments. All right. So the next one is when the, the love bomber, when faced with, um, the latest incident of not keeping his or her word, they'll say it wasn't my fault because blank, whatever the excuse is. Uh, you can rely on me. I'll never let you down again. That's a future fake, by the way. So what you would say is that is a promise that is impossible to keep, right? So the next one is when they're caught in a lie. So they'll say, I will never do that again. So what you want to say is, I will believe you when I see how you act. In other words, they don't necessarily always do what they um, say that they're going to do. So, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you act in that way. Thank you. Okay. So then the next one is when they avoid taking responsibility for a problem. Uh, they might say, you mean everything to me. We're soulmates. Remember, I don't even know why would, what I would do without you in my life. I need you. Um, you just want to respond and say, you know, that's really great. And I'm glad that you feel that way. And I look forward to seeing you do the things that you're supposed to do. Like just bring it back to them. So another love bomb that you might get is, um, you know, somebody who just like is constantly, um, absent all the time. You know, uh, I'll let you know before I go anywhere, you will always know exactly, uh, where I am. And, you know, just say something like, okay, I look forward to you doing that. And, um, thank you for saying what you're saying. And, you know, maybe even offer to, to have them put their money where their mouth is and say, all right, how about you allow me to have access to your location on your phone or something like that? Um, see what they say about that. Okay. And another one is if they treat you with irritability or disdain, um, you know, and they might say something like, Oh, you look so beautiful. You look so handsome. How did I get to be so lucky? Like they're just trying to get you away from what it was that you're trying to hold them responsibility for. Just say, um, I, I, I acknowledge what you're saying and thank you for what you're saying. However, it takes away from the point of what it is that I'm trying to make. And, um, you're making me feel like the, uh, things that I'm saying, um, uh, didn't, you're trying to make it like they didn't happen or they're not important. Did you mean for, for me to feel that way? Is that, was that your intent? And it kind of like calls it back on them because of course they're going to have to say, no, that's not what I meant. Um, so, uh, these are just a few ways that you can come back. Just remember just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, sir. Um, never explain, justify, or overshare, just, you know, respond to what it is for me to, uh, so hoovering is actually a form of love bombing that takes place during one of the other phases. So it could be, it's usually the discard phase. And during this discard phase where the narcissist might feel that they're losing control. So remember, love bombing is a form of 
controlling the victim. It's, it's a form of getting that person into their web of control. I always say their layer of control into their web. And so that it, it's a form of manipulation so that they can control you. And if they feel that sense of that grip loosening that their their grip of control is loosening because of the discard phase maybe you've hired a lawyer maybe you've talked to other people maybe they sense that you don't care that much about them as a, a, anymore that's when you start to see the hoovering start start in that's when they start to come back they start love bombing you they start saying things like oh come on you know we've always been so good together or we can work this out or you know, you don't need to worry about that. You know, I'll always have your back, things like that. As a lawyer, what I see people doing a lot of times is they'll come in when, when the person's hired the lawyer and say, oh, you don't need that lawyer. We can work this out. We've always been so good at working things out. We've always been good at talking to each other or, or something to that effect. But what hoovering is, is they are coming back and love bombing because they feel that that, that their narcissistic supply source is being threatened in some way. And they get supply from controlling you. They get supply from jerking you around. They get supply from anything that feeds their ego. So um, does this relate to brothers and sisters too? Absolutely, it does. And I see um, Didi here from Germany. Awesome, awesome. Hello in Germany. My mom is German. My dad is Chinese, so uh, I, I love my German people and my German roots. Awesome. So, and yes, it, as, Jenna, as Renee says, it can be anybody. So, yeah, these, these apply to anyone. So, hoovering happens when the narcissist senses that their control is, is, is loosening. And so, they come back and they start to love bomb again to try to get that control back again. So they go back to the tool that they used in the beginning to get you into their lair to begin with. So, you know, it might be that they're horrible to you, but then they turn around and say, oh, you're so beautiful or, you know, make you a smoothie or whatever, but behind their back, behind your back, they're, you know, stabbing you in the back where they are, smearing you or they are so it can be very very confusing when you're dealing with a narcissist because you know on the one hand they, they they seem like they're horrible to you and they're doing all these horrible things to you but then the things that are coming out of their mouth are not matching how they're behaving but they know what to say narcissists are great at manipulating. They've been, they spent thousands and thousands of hours honing their skills of manipulation. And they're especially good at knowing how to manipulate their targets or their victims. They've studied you. They know what your weaknesses are. They know what things that, that you know, they know what you want to hear. So they'll come back and say the things that they need to say in order to get you to come off of what it is that you are, you know, th that you're talking about just to get you to stop. So they'll love bomb you just enough to get you back into that web of control. And, and a lot of times it's like just to get you off of whatever it is that you're thinking. Maybe you're accusing them of cheating. Maybe you're accusing and you're, you're so they'll, they'll deflect so that you, you're not looking at that anymore and, 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 and start love bombing you in that way as well. So, um, let's see. So I, I say, hi everyone. Hi, Rebecca. Um, all right. So, uh, and remember that on Tuesdays I do my, um, ask the attorney anything sessions, which I always have tons of great questions on that. So that's Tuesdays at noon. So I've committed to going live twice a week. Uh, at noon Pacific time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on Tuesdays, I do my Ask the Attorney Anything sessions, which I also do, by the way, in my um, three must-have secrets to communicating with the narcissist free webinar 
that I offer, I offer several times a week. And I know lots and lots of you have attended that and I get to see a lot, a lot of you there as well. So um, there will be a sign up for that free webinar in the comments in this video as well once we put it up on YouTube. So if you want to participate in that, come on over and join me in that. And um, that is also free. So, um, you know, there, there's somebody saying that he wants to hurt you. Yeah, I mean, so the, the bottom line is they only use this hoovering technique to try to get you back into their web of control. It's not, they're, they're not actually, it's so confusing because it's not actually to um, make you feel better or it's, it's not anything that has anything to do with you because it never really does when it comes to narcissists. It only has to do with them. And they use it as a tool, as a tool of manipulation. So, um, and, and I often see it with, uh, when in the discard phase as, as the divorce is starting or something like that. But remember when with the narcissistic relationship, it's love bombing, devaluing and discarding, but it's not love bomb, then devalue, then discard. It goes, um, you know, it starts off with love bombing, but they can be love bombing as they're devaluing, love bombing as they're discarding, and that's what hoovering is. So that's the term of the day with hoovering, and um, you know, and 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 all forms of narcissists do this, whether it's the covert narcissist or the grandiose narcissist or the overt, you know, overt as grandiose. Uh, or the malignant narcissist, they all use this tool of hoovering in order to get the person that they have targeted to not look at their bad behavior and only be back into being a form of supply for them because that's what you serve for them is giving them a source of narcissistic supply. Remember, supply is anything that feeds their ego. It could be uh, normal things that feed people's egos, such as money and compliments and those sorts of things. But what narcissists need is an endless amount of other supply too, which is devaluing people and discarding people and um, debasing people, making people feel bad, jerking them around. So remember that when you're going to negotiate with a narcissist, you are not coming from the same place. You, reasonable person, are looking for a reasonable outcome. Narcissist person is looking to feed their ego. So if jerking you around helps to feed their ego, then they will continue to do that for as long as they need to. Uh, and that's why it's really, really hard to settle cases with narcissists. And that's why I created my slave program, which I know a lot of you have um, participated in as well. Americans spend up to 90% of their time indoors and take 20,000 breaths a day. Yet, according to the EPA, indoor air is actually more polluted than outdoor air. And in fact, 100 times more polluted than outdoor air. In fact, it's responsible for up to 7 million premature deaths annually. And I know for us, we have had issues with asthma. My daughter has struggled with asthma. And that's why we were so excited to find Air Doctor. Air Doctor has captured the attention of huge media outlets such as CNN, money, ABC, and more. And it filters out 99.9% .9 of dangerous contaminants and allergens such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, and mold, and even bacteria and viruses. So your lungs don't have to do all of that extra work. So right now, Air Doctor also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't love it, you just send it back for a refund minus shipping so head to airdoctorpro.com and use the promo code your best life and depending on the model you receive up to 39 percent off and up to 300 dollars off exclusive to podcast customers you'll also receive a three-year warranty on any unit which is an additional 84 dollars value lock in this special offer by going to air 
D-O-C-T-O-R. PRO.com and use the promo code your best life. If you're in a relationship with a narcissist, the way you got into that relationship with that narcissist, the way it all began, this whole thing all began with love bombing because that's where narcissists start. They start off with love bombing. So remember that narcissists are the the, the most shallow people you could possibly ever meet. They have no inner sense of value. All of their value has to be derived from the external. And how they do that is through what we call narcissistic supply. That's their lifeblood, that's their food, that's their oxygen. It's narcissistic supply. So supply can be in the form of money, prestige, compliments but it also comes in the form of control, coercive control, psychological abuse, um, victimization, and just going after people in a way that they get them under their layer of control. Because by asserting control over people and exerting that control over people, they feel better about themselves. They feel like they are controlling the world around them and getting everybody to see that they're so amazing and so wonderful because if they see that side of them, then they'll never see what's really going on underneath, which is that they are the most scared little people, the most fragile egos on the planet. That's actually the secret. The secret is that you're stronger than they are by a lot. And they don't want you to know that though. So, but how it all begins, how the whole fairy tale begins is through what we call love bombing. And then they, they graduate into starting with the discarding and the devaluing. Well, just devaluing, then discarding. But really, these three stages of a narcissistic relationship happen all at once in a lot of ways. It's not linear. It's not like they go from love bombing, stop, discarding, stop, then de de or sorry, devaluing, stop and then discarding stop it doesn't happen that way it's actually much more mixed together that way they can actually be discarding you and love bombing you at the same time and sometimes that's called hoovering but that's what they do they they use love bombing as a method as a strategy to manipulate you so remember that narcissists are master manipulator master manipulators you know that whole thing about 10,000 hours to become experts at something? Well, they've spent their entire lifetimes. They have way more than 10,000 hours in learning how to manipulate you. So the, the manipulation starts in the love bombing phase. So in the love bombing phase, this is where you're gonna start to see that they're gonna overwhelm the person overwhelm them with how perfect they are. So in a business setting, this love bombing might take place in the form or, or, or manifest itself in the form of, you know, being the perfect business partner, you know, but th this person can get you the deals that you want, introduce you to the clients that you want, has the skill set that you want, open the doors that you want to open. Everything about them just seems absolutely amazing. Okay, in a romantic setting, they just absolutely, they come on super strong. A, a really great example of this is the Dirty John series. And if any of you haven't seen that, you should check it out. It's a mini series actually on Netflix. It's actually also um, a podcast, which was super, super uh, popular. But the guy in that went after this woman who was a very successful woman in her 50s who had had, you know, lots of success as a professional. She also had beautiful children that she had a wonderful relationship with and a close family. But the one thing that was missing in her life was this perfect romantic partner. So this guy comes along and sets himself up to be as absolutely perfect for her as possible. And so what did he do for her? He did everything a busy professional woman who's on her own would love to have. He was taking care of her dry cleaning and cooking her dinner and making her smoothies in the morning and taking her on trips and just becoming like the most perfect person ever. 
And so that's what they do. But what they do is they move super fast. So the relationship is on this fast track. You know, they, right away, within weeks, they're talking about marriage or moving in together or, or, or um, you know, what the future is going to be forever. And they insist right away on meeting your children, if you have children from another relationship, or meeting your family, or meeting your friends. They want to be fully moved in and fully in, in control of you as fast as possible before you have a chance to figure out who this person really is. Because once they've got you under that layer of control, that's when they can start to take over and start to actually move into more of the devalue phase. What you'll see in this phase is like massive amounts of compliments and, and lavishing you with gifts and bombarding you with text messages and phone calls. And you'll start to see, you'll start to see where they want to know everything about you. They want to know where you are at all times and how come you didn't call them back right away? And um, who are you talking to? You know, right away you start to see, you start to see these little signs of things that aren't necessarily right. Um, you know, in the Dirty John movie, the, the man actually um, laid down on the woman's bed you know, in her bedroom after their first date and almost refused to leave, you know, and she saw that as a red flag, but she kind of ended up ignoring it because of all these other things. I mean, they just overwhelm you with love bombing. As part of this, they want that commitment right away. They want to see right away that you're, you know, not seeing anybody else, that you are giving them the, your undivided attention. Right away, early on, you're gonna to start to see where there's gonna be some jealousy that you're giving attention to other people. Well, if you really love me, if we were soulmates, that you would just give me all of your attention. And so you start to feel guilty if you're giving attention to somebody else, but you're, you're really feeling like, well, but this person really needs me. They're, they're, they're extremely needy. And they may even present themselves to you as partially victimized, like they just need you so much because of this, they, you know, they had a terrible family or their, maybe their ex-spouse treated them awfully or maybe, you know, the, their kids were alienated from them. So they just really, really need you and they need you now and they need all of your attention right away. So these are the kinds of things that you see in the love bombing phase and you do see these red flags start to crop up where they start to like right away in your space and right away jealous that you're doing other things, right away demanding to know everything that you're up to, right away wanting to start controlling aspects of your life, right away maybe actually even distancing you from your friends or your family or your loved ones because you know, you should be spending time with, with each other and, and that person is just jealous of the time that we're spending together and jealous that you finally found somebody that's perfect for you, jealous that you finally found a soulmate. So that, that's the kind of thing that you'll see, but they, they couch it in these terms that make it seem like it's okay that they're moving in so quickly because you're soulmates and you're meant to be together. Okay, so they're stuck in your brain. You feel stuck, you feel powerless against them. I know what it's like. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it time and time again. When I was full on practicing, I, I did high net worth divorce. That was the only kind of law I actually ever practiced. And I practiced law for more than 20 years. So I've, I've seen it. I've seen it both with men and with women, by the way. So I know a lot of people think it's just women who can't let go. It's not true. I saw men in very, very toxic relationships many, many times who couldn't let go either. I saw men who were being beat up by women who just literally couldn't let go. And all strata, rich, wealthy men who couldn't let go. So, you know, for those of you guys out there who are feeling a lot of maybe shame or guilt or anger, resentment, sadness, you're feeling stuck, you're feeling powerless, you know, you're not alone. 
It's not just women, although I know there's a lot of you women out there who are feeling that way too. And you're just feeling like, I just don't know how to get out of this. And there's there's a, a Kelly Clarkson song out there for those of you who may or may not have heard it. It's called Addicted. And every time I hear that song, I think of this, you know, it's like it goes something like, it's like you're a drug. It's like a demon I can't face down. It's like I'm stuck. It's like I'm running from you all the time. And I, I just think of that song sometimes, like, you know, you just feel like you can't let go. And, and you know, so why is that? So first of all, they start off with this unbelievable love bombing. It's very different than a lot of relationships. I mean, a lot of relationships you start off, maybe you're just friends and you, you know, you have a nice relationship and maybe you start dating and maybe it's a nice dinner. It's very different than a narcissistic beginning. You know, they come on very strong, lots and lots of attention, lavish attention. Amazing. You're, you're the most incredible human ever. You know, you're the only person in the world, the most beautiful, the most handsome, the most, they sweep you off your feet. It is intoxicating how they come on. It can be like a drug at the beginning and they make you feel very, very special at the beginning. And so that, that love bombing is very intoxicating at the beginning. And, and so it is making you feel really incredible. And, and all of these hormones in your brain are, are firing and the serotonin is being released and the, and the dopamine is being released and all of these, these things are happening. And then the devaluing sets in. And, and just so you know, when that love bombing is happening, it's happening because they are grooming you. They're grooming you because they want, they want you to be a good source of supply for them. And then that devaluing starts setting in and it's super confusing because you think, what is going on here? And, you know, there is a study by a psychologist named Robert Sapolsky, who talks about how, you know, in monkeys, when they get these rewards, they get rewarded all the time, nothing happens in their brain. And then when the, these monkeys get rewarded intermittently, like variably, and they don't know when they're going to get this reward, just the anticipation that they're going to get this reward causes the dopamine levels in their brain to rise to the level of cocaine. And, and, and that's what happens, you know, like you think, okay, am I going to get this love bomb again? Am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And that's what happens with narcissists. You come, you almost become physiologically addicted to them because then it's back to the love bombing. And it's like, after they devalue you and they're super hurtful, then they, they come back and they start love bombing again to get you off of the fact that they may have ghosted you or devalued you or lied to you or caught them. And, you know, they start the future faking projection and deflection, and they do all of these things. Just know that the love bombing that they do in the beginning, things that they're saying, the things that they're they're doing as hard as it may sound, it, it doesn't actually have anything to do with you. I know it's pretty harsh to even say, but it's really just them grooming you to be a good source of supply for them because they want you to start to adulate them and become a good source of supply for them. It's, it's really a deposit because they want to start taking withdrawals in, from that bank account that they're depositing into. And then what happens is a lot of times you've now built your life around this person. And I, I, I think of that Stevie Nicks song, Landslide, you know, uh, I, now I, I'm afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. And that relationship becomes your identity. And sometimes financially you're tied to this person. There's this whole thing with the limbic system and there's there's other things going on physiologically that make you think that you can't leave this person, that survival is telling you that if you leave this person, that everything will be bad. And, and there's triggers that cause you to crave them. There's a lot of other things going on. But here's the great thing about the brain. 
the brain is actually something that can be retrained. There's a lot that we've learned about the brain and I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to spend some personal time with Jim Quick and some of the other brain experts in the world. And we know a lot more about the neuroplasticity of the brain than we, we've known for thousands of years. I and mean, we've learned more in the last 10 years about the brain than we've known ever. And the brain is actually extremely retrainable. And the brain is actually just a supercomputer that can be retrained. And you can actually retrain your brain to be retaught that you don't need this person. And I've helped thousands of people through my programs and through the things that I teach to get on the other side of, of these narcissists. And that's why I have like my, my narc slayer club membership where I have a support group and I have Danielle, who's part of my narc slayer club, who has a background in mental health and, sh and through her support groups, you know, we help people get on the other side of these things by retraining the brain. And you can do this, you can retrain your brain. And so I want you to put in the comments right now, I can do this. Because by starting to say things like that, you're actually starting to send a message to your brain that you can do this. So I want you to put that in the comments right now. I can do this because you can, you're going to start to send a message to your brain that you can, you're telling a different story. And then that's what you're, you're going to do. And that's what you are doing now. And by watching these videos, you're already starting to send a different message to your brain as well. So give yourself a pat on the back for doing that, for just being here for just starting to recognize what's going on. Making that transition between summer and fall is always a crazy thing. And that's why I love having a leather jacket, like my gorgeous one from Quince. And they have timeless and high quality items, which I love, and they don't blow my budget, which I also love. They have cashmere sweaters and washable silk tops, and everything is like 50 to 80% less than other brands, which I also love. They cut out the middleman. They pass the savings on to us, which is also amazing. It's safe and ethical, which I also love. I really love my brown leather jacket from them. It's super stylish and it's high quality. Just love that. So make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high quality closet essentials go to quince.com slash negotiate for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's quince.com slash negotiate to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash negotiate. Okay. So let's know, learn about little known facts about narcissistic love bombing that you probably never knew before. Number one is it has nothing to do with love. In fact, while they start off maybe saying they love you, even maybe before you start dating, it actually has nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with manipulation. In fact, everything narcissists do has to do with manipulation. Everything they do is a manipulation. It has to do with control. They use love bombing as a way to get you started conditioning you. So what they're doing is conditioning you from the beginning to get you into their web, to get you into their lair. It, they use charm. They use their charisma. They use their personality. They have learned early on to mirror you. And I've heard many people actually say they kind of fell in love with themselves which is sort of true in a way because they they kind of are very, very adept at seeing what it is that you want to see. That's one thing they're very, very good at. They read people 
in an excellent way. It's a survival skill for them that they've learned from the beginning. You know, from the time that they were very, very young, they knew that they had to start to read people in order to be able to get what they want in order to survive. You know, narcissists are people that had, a, you know, probably a fair amount of trauma in their childhood or their needs weren't met in some way. And so in order to get their needs met, they had to learn how to read people. The first thing is narcissistic love bombing has nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with, you know, charming people in order to condition them so that they can start to get what they want. It's a deposit that they're making so that they can start making withdrawals in order to get what they want. And they, they do this so that they can get to phase two as quickly as possible, which is the withdrawal phase. Let me tell you, it, it doesn't matter if it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, which is number two, little known fact. The number two little known fact is that it, they use this in all relationships, not just romantic ones. So, you know, whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, they will use this type of love bombing. Sometimes it's called the idealization phase because, you know, it just does, it seems too perfect. Like, where has this person been all of my life? And I know because I was in a business relationship with a covert narcissist who seemed uh, absolutely perfect at the beginning where has this person been? Oh my gosh, you know, they have all the perfect contacts. They say all the right things. They seem to have all the skill sets that you need for a, you know, or, or whatever it is, you know, so, and they want to immediately get into the next level, invest in the company or get their names on things or get to something where they're, they want you to be committed as soon as possible, because the, they don't want to have to make deposits for very long. They, they want you to be the one who's giving them the value and not vice versa. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is love bombing is not just at the beginning of the relationship. They'll use it at many different times during the relationship. They start to devalue you which is sort of the next part of the relationship. And then they will go back to using the love bombing when necessary. So, you know, if you if they sense that you're going to be leaving and you're, you're kind of done, it's tired of them manipulating you, ghosting you, this crazy hot and cold situation, then they will start to love bomb you again to get you back into, pull you back in. They use it in many different situations. Sometimes it's called future faking. Sometimes it's called hoovering or different time, different uh, terms. But they use love bombing or the, this kind of charm that they have to manipulate you in different ways. So. It's it's something that they use to get what it is that they want, okay? So it's used in many different times, different ways in the relationship, not just at the beginning of the relationship. Again, not just business, not just personal, and it has nothing to do with love, So, but it's not just at the beginning of the relationship either. And number four as I mentioned, they use love bombing to manipulate. It is a tool that is used in order to get what it is that they want. So, you know, for example, you know, if they're supposed to accomplish a task, for example, they were supposed to do something for the business, a business plan, business plan. Oh, yes, I'm going to do it. It's not done. And, you know, months go by, it hasn't been accomplished. And then you, you're finally like, you know what? This business partnership is not working out. 
I'm tired of asking you over and over again to accomplish these various tasks, in, including write this business plan. You haven't done it. I'm, I've am i been doing all the work here. I think I'm, since I'm doing all the work, I might as well just be on my own. Well, then all of a sudden they'll come back and say, oh, you know what? I will do everything that you ask. I will get the plan done. Look at me. I promise that you'll see in the future it'll be different. You know, and then suddenly they start to do the work. They start to do the things. Look how amazing you are. They'll start to tell you how incredible you are, how incredible you guys are together. You know, they'll say all the things they need to say, or they'll go back to being the charming, incredible person that you remember at the beginning. So they use love bombing to manipulate you. I would love to know the types of things that you guys have seen, the types of phrases that you guys have seen as far as love bombing. Go ahead and put those in the comments. You're perfect for me. We're soulmates. You sweep me off my feet. Uh, I've never met anybody like you. You guys have seen things like that. Go ahead and put those in the comments because that's the kind of thing that they say when you when they're love bombing, right? That's the thing you know you, you'll see when you see love bombing. Number five is I want you to know that love bombing is a deposit. It's a deposit. They expect repayment for it and quickly and get used to it. You know, it's almost like a loan shark. They want interest and they want massive amount back. They want more back than they put into it, like way more, way more. You know, they, they might have put in like this much. They want this much back in return, you know, and what they want overall is control. They want control over you and they want your undivided attention and, and undivided loyalty. You know, if they smell at all that you are not 100% loyal in any way or any slight of any kind, then, you know, there, there's going to be hell to pay. Because for, for narcissists, you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, then you are public enemy number one. That's why in this video, I'm going to be talking about the five l favorite love bombing sayings of narcissists. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, go ahead and do that now. Subscribe and hit that notification bell because I do release brand new free content every single day. I'm really, really committed to making sure that you have access to as many free resources as you possibly can, because I want you to be able to take your power back. And in the same spirit of having access to free resources, I also have in another free resource for you, which is free phrases for disarming narcissists, free phrases for disarming narcissists. And you can just go to disarmthenarc.com, disarmthenarc.com and grab those free phrases for disarming narcissists. It's just little ways to start shifting that dynamic, shifting that power. You know, I, it's, I call it like a power switch for you. Start getting your power back. For this video, I'm going to just go over just some of their favorite phrases. You know, it, it's so interesting that we, we talk a lot about how narcissists have this same sort of playbook, this same sort of, it was, it's almost like they went to narcissist school or something, you know, it's kind of crazy. Narcissist Academy, they all went to Narcissist Academy. It, it, you know, they didn't, but it, one of the things that they would have learned had they gone to Narcissist Academy is how to be super charming how to appear really amazing and incredible at the beginning, how to, to present themselves so that you will be swept off your feet right from the beginning. Because obviously you're not going to go running into the arms of this person who's going to turn out to be really, really hurtful 
one of the, the most hellish relationships of your life, if they weren't charming and charismatic and personable and, and usually extremely well-groomed and good-looking and, and well-spoken and all kinds of polished and, and all of the things that you want to see in a person. And a lot of times they're using mirror neurons. I mean, that's the thing that you don't even realize is that a lot of times they are actually kind of mirroring what you want to see. They're, they're, they're lining up to be exactly what you wanted in a person. The first thing that they're going to say to you is, we're soulmates. Where have you been all of my life? Because they want you to believe that they're that one person, that one person for you, and you are that one person for them. There's no one else on the planet for you, and there's no one else on the planet for them. It was destiny. It was fate that you were put on this planet for the purpose of meeting them and vice versa. Everything has aligned for that purpose. And you, you really do believe that at the beginning. There's like this, that whole Jerry Maguire thing that you complete me. And they kind of say things like that too. The next thing that they'll say is we're perfect for each other, you know, so th they'll, they'll start to look for all the things that you have in common. Even if, you, you know, you might find out down the road that maybe you don't have all those same things in common, but they'll, they'll make it sound like you do at the beginning. So, you know, it's, and it's not like chocolate ice cream. You both like chocolate ice cream. It's like big things. Wow. We both had this major trauma in our childhood and we both really believe this in spiritually. And we both have this sort of thing in our history. We both had massive problems with our exes. These are massive, huge things that you end up finding. And that's why we're perfect for each other. Uh, and so then the next thing that they'll say is, let's get married right away, or let's move in together right away. You know, let's jump into this thing right away. You know, within a few weeks, within a few months, sometimes within a few days, it'll be right away that they want to lock in that relationship. You know, I want to meet your family. I want to meet your kids. If, if you have kids, I want to be to that next level as soon as possible. And these are, these are also massive red flags, the kinds of things that they're saying, these, these, these love bombing sayings are also massive red flags. I want you to put that in the comments right now, red flags, red flags, the bells in your head should be going off and the hairs on the neck should be standing straight up because as good as it feels to have somebody tell you how amazing you are, that, you know, you are so gorgeous or handsome or beautiful and intelligent and smart and all the things. This is a huge, these are huge red flags. All right. The next one is I've never met anyone like you before. You are so special. You are so different. You are so incredible. You are so unique. This is where Again, you're the exact right person for me. No one else is. No one else understands me the way you do. I know that no one else understands you the way I do. That's why we were meant for each other. That's the next one. And then the last one, so premature and so quick and so, again, inappropriate. And yes, it might feel good, but not appropriate. This last one, I love you. I mean, I've heard narcissists that will say, I love you to people before the first date. And they'll say, I just know. 
I just knew you're the right one. I just knew. If you have some kind of wounding within you because you had a lot of trauma in your growing up and you just want to feel loved by somebody and you're just craving that, it feels so good to have somebody come along and say, you're amazing, you're unique, I see you, you matter, you're beautiful, I love you, you're special, I want to meet everyone in your world, I want to be a part of you. I mean, how can you not want that? Of course. But the problem is, it feels so good. And then they rip it from you almost immediately. And as good as that feels, it feels so much worse when they start ripping it from you. So much worse. So it is so much better to recognize it on the front end and go, no, I'm resisting. I'm resisting this drug. I got I to gotta say no. Just say no. I, I recognize what's going on here. And this is not for me. I'd rather have a healthy relationship. What if you could just take a shot and lose all the weight you wanted to? I know for me, a few years ago, I was dealing with thyroid issues, menopause issues, autoimmune issues, all the things, and I gained a bunch of weight and I lost it all, but it took forever. And I wish that something like Row Body had been around back then to help me lose the weight. But now you get the benefit of it because Robody is now around to help you lose weight. It's just one shot a week and combined with a healthy lifestyle, you can lose 15 to 20% of your weight in a year on average and actually keep it off. They've helped more than 200,000 people so far and they help you even with support with getting the medication through your insurance and everything that you need so that you can actually lose the weight. That means that it's such a great opportunity for you now. So average weight loss is 15 to 20% in a year with a healthy lifestyle change and BMI and other eligibility criteria apply. Go to ro.co slash Rebecca. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 a month for your first month and $145 a month after that. And medication costs are separate. That's ro.co slash Rebecca. When the narcissist knows that you know, you will, you know, you're going to have to deal with some stuff first. But then it'll change and you're going to know what to do. All right. So the first thing that the narcissist is going to do is they're going to turn on the charm because that's what they do. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And so they're going to go back to the well. They're going to go back to what worked for them at the beginning, which was that love bombing thing. That's what they did at the beginning. So they're going to turn on that charm and they're going to see if that works at least initially because they're going to be panicking a little bit. So they may try to love bomb you, future fake you, try to see if that works. Oh, you know, we can do this, you know, whatever it is. And this is the same thing if it's in a romantic relationship or a business relationship, they do the same thing. I was in a business relationship with a narcissist. It was the same thing. When I started to try to exit out of the business relationship, suddenly the business partner started doing all the things that they were supposed to be doing all the way through the relationship, which was actually to me annoying because it was like they knew what, what they were supposed to be doing the whole time and didn't do it. So I was like thinking, oh, so you knew what you were supposed to be doing. So to me, that didn't work. So what happens is they realize, oh, this isn't working because when you're done, you're done, right? So this is, you know, the narcissist knows you're on to them. So now they're starting to feel threatened by your knowledge. They're threatened. And so with the narcissist, it's all black and white, black and white. You're either for them or against them. There's no gray area. And remember, they're very easily slighted, very easily slighted. So once they realize that you're on to them, you become public enemy number one. Now they're going to try to silence you. Now you are going to be the enemy. They're going to try to gaslight you 
to try to say, hey, whatever it is that you think you know, you don't know. So they're going to try to make you believe that whatever it is, that information that you might have, you don't have, or it's wrong, or that you're crazy, you're delusional, that sort of thing. So they may even try to discredit you, try to attack you. They'll go to others try to get them to be on their side. Now, this may have been going on for a while, by the way, especially if it's covert narcissists, because, you know, they instinctively know that it may not work out at some point. So even long before the discard phase actually happens, if they think that it's going to be happening at some point, they will start that planting of seeds with third parties because they don't want you to feel aligned with anyone else in their world. They want you to be sort of isolated. They want to be the ones aligned with other people. They don't want you to be the ones aligned with other people. So they make sure that you feel isolated. They make sure that they're the ones that have the people aligned with them and you feel like you don't have. So they'll make sure they know that they spoke to this person and you didn't, or they have the closer relationship and you don't and that they talk to them more or that they got the better information from that person. And, and everything's sort of a competition, even before you actually have the, the breakup with this person, because it's, it's got to be a competition with them. You know, and e even if you're not that way, and you're all over there going, that's great that you spoke to that person, or that's lovely that you had that conversation, or I'm so glad you had lunch with that person. They don't see it that way. They still want you to feel like you're isolated or you, they have this better thing going on. And and so it's it's very difficult to have a normal relationship with a person when they're not having a normal relationship with you. What's happening though, is they're planting seeds against you with these third parties, whether it's dropping little things about you. Well, they're not really working all that hard or they don't really like you or they drink too much. Whatever it is that they're saying about you, she does this thing, or she doesn't really take care of the kids, or she's not great with numbers. They just drop these little things that aren't great. And so when it comes time to actually have the breakup, they've already discredited you in such a way that it actually seems plausible to do the full on attack because they've sprinkled in these, these little things about you all along. So they constantly are discrediting, 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 and planting seeds, planting enough doubt, planting enough doubt, planting enough doubt. And that way, you know, this other person's sort of looking, looking, looking for something about you. And, and if there's just the hint of something like there's that confirmation bias going on. Oh yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's that manipulation going on of people around you. It's just, it, it could be sort of subliminal. That's what's happening of the people around you. And you may not even realize that it's going on. So that's what happens when the narcissist knows that, you know, another thing that happens when the narcissist knows that, you know, is they will start filing false pleadings against you in court. They might start doing that, you know, depending on how 
malignant they are. They might even file things against you that are completely false, you know, say things that are, you know, completely will ruin your life. I've seen that before. One of the things that you need to do early on is make sure you go on the offensive, make sure that you keep track of everything, document, document, document. And one of the things that I tell people constantly is don't fall for, oh, we don't need lawyers or we can just settle this ourselves, that sort of thing. You get lulled into believing that they want to do this amicably or that something like that. Let me tell you, if they were liars the whole entire time that you were in a relationship with them, whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, they're most certainly not going to start telling you the truth when you're on opposite sides. It doesn't make any sense. They will definitely be lying to you now. They are out for themselves. And you are public enemy number one. Don't fall for it. You need to take care of yourself. I know that you know, this is what happens when the narcissist knows that you know. If you understand what I'm saying, give me an amen in the comments right now. Just write amen in the comments because you know that I know what I'm talking about over here, right? It's all black and white with them. They're in it for themselves. And what happens is if you fall for it, then you end up so far behind in the negotiations or so far behind in the communications. And by the time you figure out what's going on, they've gotten away with so much and you feel like things are so unfair but part of it is because you started off at the beginning with thinking that everything was going to be good or everything was going to be nice or you just wanted what's fair and you just wanted what was good. And, you know, you came at it with such good intentions, but they didn't. They didn't, even though that may have been what came out of their mouth. That's not what they felt. So keep track of everything document everything, stay on the offensive, stay on the offensive. You know, if you're an empath, which more than likely you probably are, it probably goes against your brain to do that. You probably feel like, oh, I don't want to fight. But let me just tell you, if you don't want to fight and you're dealing with a narcissist, then that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. It's counterintuitive. But that is what you end up having to do. So tell us a little bit about you and your background and your, I mean, you were on Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. I mean, like, tell us all about your life in general. Like, Sure. So I am born and raised from Detroit, Michigan. I had the amazing experience of growing up there and eventually went on to college where I was a music education major at Jackson State University and I was in the band. I played the clarinet and the tuba and eventually I started teaching music in Michigan and in Mississippi and in Georgia and I just lost my passion for music and started acting. Um, this is the the short version of <laughs> the the bio started acting, packed up my 2004 Ford Focus and drove from Detroit, Michigan, all the way to Los Angeles, California. This was in 2007 to pursue a career in acting. And I stayed there for 16 years. After two weeks of me living in Los Angeles, I got my first agent. Maybe the same year I started doing TV, reality TV, a TV show on ABC called Dance Machine and then Dance Your Ass Off on Oxygen. And that was where I was able to become Googleable and I got my first manager. Uh, her name was Lynn Badgley, Penn Badgley's mother of Gossip Girl. And she got me my first TV job on Nickelodeon's Victorious where I played Andre's crazy cousin Kendra. From there, I just kept the ball rolling, kept working hard, networking, studying my craft, 
to eventually doing a cast and director workshop and with Jamie Castro, one of the cast and directors for Grey's Anatomy, I ended up uh, doing seven episodes of Grey's Anatomy as Nurse Kathleen. And from there, you know, my career just took off. I kept working, kept um, kept grinding, kept hustling in Los Angeles till I booked a role on the Oprah Winfrey Network, Ambitions as a series regular as Darcia Lancaster, the cousin that you love to hate. And that eventually relocated me to Atlanta, Georgia, where I live now. Um, and I was on that TV show. And that was my two minute <laughs> short version of me being a musician to transitioning into acting. And now I'm in Atlanta and I am living my best life as a mother to a beautiful four-year-old toddler, Marley Nicole. Beautiful. Okay. So how did a narcissist enter your life? You know, Rebecca, what's really interesting is that I've been dealing, dating, um, been around narcissists my whole life, but didn't know that's what they were. Um, and it's really interesting this time around, <laughs> I was, it was during the global pandemic. I was on a live streaming app and I met a gentleman that pursued me romantically and we started dating. And from there, uh, he started love bombing me. And I figured out as the relationship went forward that it wasn't genuine. And the only way that I knew how to heal from it was by journaling and, you know, writing a book about it. So tell us what your definition is of love bombing. My definition of love bombing is when you meet someone and from the beginning, they inundate you with lovely, I love you messages. You're the best thing since sliced bread. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. They text you all the time. They call you all the time. They FaceTime you. They spend a lot of time with you. They buy extravagant gifts for you. They do extravagant gestures for you. And it's like a dream come true. You think it's the best thing ever, um, but it's all a lie because you'll find out later on when they go through the other processes that narcissists do that it wasn't genuine. It was all a, a means to their madness to try to control you. And it, usually it's pretty quick that you find yeah. that out. So it's, tell it's us about pretty, that. Mm -hmm. It's very quick that you find that out because maybe we were, were, were talking, um, a month and at like in, in the first two weeks, everything moved very, very fast. And then that person, uh, wanted to come visit me at my house during the pandemic. I let him come here. And then immediately when he left, things changed. It was like night and day. He wasn't calling me as much. He wasn't texting me as much. He wasn't telling me these wonderful things anymore. It was like immediately, um, things changed and it started the devalue and the discard uh, process of what narcissists do. Okay, so tell us about devalue and discard. Let's go to devalue next. Yeah, so with my set narcissists and, and all narcissists, because birds of a feather flock together, they all do the same thing. With the devalue process, everything that I did wasn't good enough anymore, or I was becoming worrisome, or I was calling too much, or I was needy, whereas I just talked to you last week all day for seven hours, but now you don't have time for me, or you're working all the time, whereas before you had all the time in the world to call me, you call me all day, all night, we would be on the phone all day, all night, but everything changed now, so um, I wasn't good enough. I don't really think he... he he would say that I would have issues, that I had unresolved issues like with my parents and just tried to downplay me or make me think that I wasn't good enough all of a sudden where before I was his princess, his queen and 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 saying, you know, different terms of endearment like that. And it, it immediately changed. Right. And and then how is it that narcissists get people to then stay in their world because they devalue right away and all of a sudden you're needy, they're lying, they're, you know, they're, they're ghosting you, they're not showing up. Why wouldn't people just immediately go, I don't need this? You know, how do, how do people get that? How do narcissists get people to stay there? How do they get, well, for, for me and just in general, in that love bombing stage, 
that is very addicting. It's it's like it's synonymous to you being addicted to crack or di- addicted to heroin where you're on a drug, you're you're in a euphoric feeling. So you always want to feel that feeling. And as soon as you, you know, say something, because that happened when I was going through the devalue stage um, in the discard stage where I saw something wasn't right and things weren't adding up. Uh, it seemed like he was bipolar or he had like some personality issues. I didn't know what it was, but I just knew something was wrong. And me and him got into like a really, really bad argument. And he was yelling at me at the top of his lungs. He was just really acting like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. High. And I said, you know, this is too much for me. I wish you nothing but the best. God bless you. Good luck. And at that time, I'm like, I'm about to move on because something is wrong here. And that's immediately that night, he started to gaslight me and love bomb me again. And so because you already have that initial euphoric love bombing period where you're already bonded with this person or trauma bonded with them, when they're saying these things again, because you're a natural empath and you're believing what they're saying to you because you tell the truth, you would think someone else would tell the truth. So you get sucked back into it. And then it's, it starts over and over again and they keep it going. So like, I remember vividly being on the phone, like, am I in the twilight zone? Why is this person saying all these things to me? And now he's calling me at two o'clock in the morning saying, oh, you're going to leave me. You're going to make me get another woman. I thought you said you love me. I thought you said you want to spend the rest of them. You just called me everything but a child of God three hours ago, sir. W- what is going on here? And so I didn't know anything about narcissism. I didn't know this is what people do. So I, I just, I, I didn't know. <laughs> but they, they know how to manipulate you. They know exactly what to say, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And they, yes. and they future fake you. Yes. And yes. they say exactly what they know you want to hear. Absolutely. So that you'll stay. Absolutely. And it's and it a works. rubber band thing that mm. they push you to the edge and then they snap you back in. Right. Yes. And and this happened to me at least 30 times, you know, where we would get in an argument and or I would try to leave him alone. And I still didn't know he was a narcissist. Still didn't know. And he like you just said, the pushing and the pulling and and the devaluing and the discarding and then the gaslighting It's just it was total BS the whole time. It's like if you say you want to do something, if you want to be with me then be with me. You know, the next stage that happened was we, um, he was coming. I wanted wanted you to, to explain that because I want people to understand people who aren't in relationships with narcissists to understand, well, why don't people just leave? You know, if they're treating you badly, why don't you just leave? You know, (laughs) and, and, and because a lot of people, I think, think that, And I want you to explain, it's just so not that easy. And I, I, you know, and I think it's really important that you explain why it's not so easy to just go, yeah, you know, I'm just going to be out of here, you know? It's not easy um, because, you know, I would talk to my mother about it and she wouldn't understand just why can't you just let it go? Why can't you just leave him alone? And you, you, If it was a regular relationship, that's exactly what what would that's what you would do in a regular relationship. But this is not a regular relationship. This is something that I feel is very demonic, very toxic. And anytime you try to leave, their sole mission is to control you, to use you for their narcissistic supply because they're empty and soulless on the inside. So they don't want you to leave because they're sucking all your goodness away from you. Okay, and every time you have an interaction with them, they're pulling that energy, they're pulling your vibes, they're pulling all of your your inner goodness, and they're using that to fill themselves up. So that's one thing. Another thing is that anytime you try to leave them and you try to move on down the road, they're going to do many different tactics to pull you back in and to to grab you back in just so they can have you under their thumb. It's the sickest thing I've ever encountered because I I literally can tell you, I'm like, why won't this person just leave me alone? 
And then they would have other people that they're talking to, that they're dating. He had a whole girlfriend I didn't even know anything about. And then he would have several other people that he's talking to at the same time. So why are you why are you bothering me? Leave me alone. I, I've said, leave me alone. I want to go on with my life. Every time I try to go on with my life, he's pulling me back in. I love you. Don't leave me. All of this. And every time, for at least the first 10 times, you want to believe it because you really... From the love bombing stage, you really are in love with this person. Mm -hmm. And you want to believe somehow on some level Mm -hmm. that maybe they do love you. Maybe they do think you that you're special, Mm -hmm. that, you know, you do have something that's real. Yes. Well, you think it's real. You think I thought it was real. I thought, you know, I was the Bonnie to his Clyde because he was artistic. You know, he was he was into artistic endeavors. Um, and I was an actress. I was going to be his muse. I just thought he was like the best thing ever. And I really thought that this was my guy. This was my man. This was, would be my potential soulmate, but it was all a lie. It was all a lie. And it, as, as the process kept going on and on and on and, uh, into a year later, and he's still doing the same things, (laughs) It's like enough is enough. You start writing about it. You start researching. You start finding wonderful people like yourselves, like you on Instagram and on Facebook where you see, okay, I'm not crazy. This is a thing. This is real. This person is is systematically trying to manipulate me and trying to take control of me and is literally playing me to the left. And once you realize that and you see everything that's going on, you're like, okay. I'm not crazy. I'm just going to have to figure out a way to heal from this and move on. Yeah. And what was that moment for you? I I knew when we were, we were on one of the app, we were on the app and he was trying to embarrass me having his, um, his flying monkeys. And those are terms for people that are advocates for the narcissist to take up for them that believe everything that they say and they attack you in the process because they're trying to defend the narcissist. When he sent his flying monkeys out to me, I knew that something was wrong. Why would this person try to embarrass me? Why would this person try to um, harm me when I'm just trying to go on my way? Um, I think the worst thing that you can do to a narcissist is expose them. Mm-hmm. Um, and from the beginning, once I saw that this, he was first, I called him a love bomber because that was the first term that I, that I found. But as I saw that he was a narcissist, I was really working hard to say, Hey, this person isn't right. Okay. But at the same time, he was starting a whole smear campaign against me saying that I was crazy, that I was psycho, that I was stalking him and all of these lies where people would literally believe him until I started recording the conversations that we would have. And I started doing that because no one would believe the things that I, I'm saying because they're believing him. They're not believing me. They think I'm a stalker. They think I'm crazy and I'm not. And it just enough became enough. I started journaling because I literally thought I was losing my mind. And my friend, I would talk to one of my, I would talk to a small amount of friends because people wouldn't believe me and they didn't understand what was going on. So you couldn't really talk to a lot of people about what was going on because people would get frustrated. A couple of people stopped talking to me because they, they said that talking about this was triggering for them or it was too negative. And so there was a small amount of friends that I could talk to. And one of them told me like, Mara, you should just write this down. And it sounds like you're in a whole like telenovela of a soap opera. <laughs> this could be, this could be a, a movie. Yeah, this exactly. Be, I mean, know, that's what that's what it's like living with them. That's what it's like. And um, Rebecca, what's really interesting is that the relationship that I had with this narcissist was only two months long, but it felt like it was two and a half years long. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was in a business partnership with a narcissist, and when I realized that from beginning to end, it was only one year. I couldn't believe it because it felt like 10, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so I believe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so how did you get out of it then? Um, 
truth, truthfully, to this day, he still contacts me. Mm. Um, I've blocked him. I actually have to go to court against um, my narcissist because it's just a big deal for me to advocate for myself um, because he owes me a substantial amount of money. And I had to prove to myself that you can't do this to people, that there are consequences and repercussions. So I'm going to take you to the highest extent of the law. Have I tried to um, rectify the situation or, you know, have a compromise? Yes. But he told, he called me on my name and told me to take him to court. Okay. Just unfortunately it's taken two years for that court case to come around in New York city. So, mm, well, so, that's what yeah. happens, right? Yes. <laughs> so what made you decide to write a book? I started to write the book because it was the only thing that I could do that made me feel better to take a stance. Like, everything that was happening on the app, everything that he was doing to me, I felt powerless. The abuse that I was getting from him, from his friends, from his flying monkeys, I didn't know what else to do but write about it and write a book about it because that was my way of saying, hey, you can't do this to me and I'm going to show you why you can't because I'm going to write about it. And so that's what started, that's what started me down the path to write it. I didn't really know how to write a book. Um, so I enlisted a, a writing coach, AJ Joyner of Biloxi Books. He helped me out with that, starting that. But then when he started to read the book, he said, Mara, this is really good. And you can use this as a, a tool and a vessel to help other people not go through the same thing that you went through. So that's when I started adding all of the narcissistic terms to it, where at first it was just based off of what happened off of my experiences. But then I added things to it. I added a lot of fictional elements. You know, I'm an actress, so my mind wanders and it goes <laughs> way to the left. So I started adding bits and pieces from other um, encounters with narcissists into the book as well. Mm. And why did you decide to write a book about narcissism instead of acting? <laughs> that's a good question you know there are so many acting books out there and I think we are flooded with acting this acting that entertainment this entertainment that um I never knew about love bombing I never knew about narcissism I felt like it was an untapped untapped um genre or uh, and people don't know about it and they do know about it, but they don't talk about it, especially in the African-American community. A lot of times we'll just gloss off over it like, oh, that's just Tyrone. You know, he's mannish or, you know, his mama didn't raise him. Right. You know, this is. And so we just we uh, flip it under the rug and we don't really talk about it. But I really felt that it was important to have it come from a perspective from someone like me that you would think has everything together, but still would be a victim to this type of abuse. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I like to do is, is I, I, I like to get people to actually verbalize how they felt when they were at their lowest, because I think it's important for people to feel what other people were feeling, you know, and, and actually understand that it's not just them, you know? So when you were at your lowest, can you verbalize some of the things that you were feeling? Because you you just used the word powerless, and I think when when you when people hear that you, that's how you felt, people are going to go, oh yeah, I felt that way too. So yeah. can you just verbalize some of the other words like that you felt at your lowest? Powerless. I felt like I was possessed under a demonic spell of this person, where all I could think about was them and why they didn't love me and why they would do this to me. Um, I felt, uh, I felt black, a black hole of, of deceit and deception. And, and I felt sorrow. I felt pain. I felt misery. I, I wouldn't wish, I felt powerless. I felt hopeless. I felt like this would never end. I felt like literally I was about to die. Mm, 
Yeah, that's just so. Thank you for being willing to be so vulnerable and yeah. sharing that. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to to come out and talk about that and share that. And so I really appreciate you being willing to do that because I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. You know, I mean, I I know for me, you know, I didn't want to talk about it for the longest time because I'm feel I'm over here going, you know, I'm supposed to be strong, I'm supposed to be powerful, I'm supposed to be this badass attorney, but you know, I felt like it was in sharing my story like that it it helped a lot of people, you know, right. because for me, it was like, I was, I would wake up in the middle of the night. I'm thinking about it. I would wake up in the morning. I'm thinking about it. I'm like brushing my teeth. I'm thinking about it. I'm walking the dog. I'm thinking about it. It's like, you, you just like, it takes over your thoughts. You, all of your thoughts. Literally all the time. You, you, you just, you, you become obsessed. Yes. Obsessed. Yes. You know, obsessed to the point of, a ritual of, of following what he's doing on social media. If he was on the live streaming app, watching his every move, watching his girlfriend, watching the other girls that he's dating, seeing what they're doing, seeing if they're saying anything. I mean, because you feel like they're, they're out to get you. They're out to get you. And, and then you, because the empath and you, you want to help the other person that's involved with him, let them know, Hey, abort, abort, get away from him. Yeah. Not, I mean, not... like, Oh my God, you know? Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you've healed now? I, I am probably like an 80%. I'd say 75%. I I'm a lot better. Um, I still have a long way to go. I'm in therapy. I, this has been therapeutic just talking on different platforms and being on Instagram and just the community that we have, the narcissism community, and just how much me telling this story is helping other people and the things that they're writing is so needed. Like, because people just don't have an outlet as to why this is happening or how they can get out of it. And I know that I am making an impact and that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do you hope that readers take away from, from your book? I hope that readers will see the signs of a narcissist from reading my book. Like they can recollect and say, Oh, that's what happened in Mara's book to Heather. Oh, that's when Kyrie did X, Y, and Z. Oh, wait a second. This guy is talking to me too much. And he's like laying it on thick. Whoa. He, is he love bombing me? Cause my friend said, Mara, I think a guy I dated, he was trying to love bomb me. <laughs> She said yeah. that to me like a couple of weeks ago. I said, I said, well, how did you know? He was, he told me that he wanted to get married to me. I was like, yep, run for us, run. And run, run, run for the hills, right? For the hills. Yeah. So that's what I would like for people just to see the signs so that they don't have to go through this. Yeah. And mm -hmm. protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Protect themselves and protect their family and their friends just to, to bring more awareness to it. So people are cognizant of, who, what? Because uh, there's a lot of selfish people out here. So there's a difference between someone being selfish and someone that being self-absorbed and being a narcissist. Okay, so let's talk about that double life of narcissists. Well, the thing is that even though they act like they are super powerful and they're they're constantly puffing themselves up and they want you to think that they're smarter than you, better than you, that they act entitled, it really is just an act. The bottom line is that they are actually way more afraid of you than you are of them. They are actually the most scared little creatures on the planet. You know, the old Billy Joel song, you know, the stranger, we all have that face that we hide away forever. We take them out and show ourselves when everyone is gone. I think he was actually talking about the narcissist. I don't know kind of showing my age when I talk about that song. I don't know. But honestly, that's kind of what it is. They, they've got this hidden face. They've kind of split into two. They were traumatized as a child. Something happened to them where, you know, they decided that the world was a really scary place. They decided that the world is a place of survival. And it, it's a me and everybody else world. They live in this world of their own, this world of survival. 
And that's why they don't have any empathy for anyone else because it's kind of like this oxygen thing, you know, the airplane is going down and I have to put my mask on. And if I don't put my mask on, I'm not going to survive. And, and I don't think they think about it consciously. I'm sure that they don't. It's so embedded subconsciously, but like even the smallest things, the tiniest things, you know, if they give at all, then they don't have, and somehow they, they won't be seen. They won't be heard. You know, all human beings have this need to feel seen, heard, and know that they matter, but people who are secure in themselves people who know that they matter, who have that internal knowing that they matter, they know that they're seen, they know that they're heard, they have that feeling. So they don't need that constant seeking that they don't have that desperate need to be seen and heard and that desperate need to be have admiration and, and adulation from the outside world constantly. And it's not just admiration and adulation, it's also this desperate need to, to be better than and, and control. That is the uh, what I call the dark underbelly and all that desperate need, all of that feeding, 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 that's called supply. That supply is their oxygen, it's their lifeblood, it's their food. It's what they feed on. And there is a dark hole, a black hole that can never be fed. That is what they never want you to know. So they have this double life. There's this scared little creature inside. And then there's this other facade. And I mean, they never want you to see the, the scared little person underneath. And by the way, I have a whole video on how narcissists react to exposure, which you should definitely check out. And also, by the way, this is the whole key to how to negotiate powerfully with narcissists. And this is the whole key to my slay methodology, which is strategy, leverage, anticipating and focusing on you and what I teach. The self-centeredness is what drives them to exploit people. It, it's what drives them to use people. It's what drives them to create this facade because they don't want to be seen as failures. They create this persona. They want to be seen as winners. They have these two separate lives, this public life where they want to be seen as the winner, the, the best the, with the right people, the prestigious friends and all that. And they spend a whole lot of time, energy and capital to be seen as that person. And by the way, if you know that what I'm saying is right, give me a for sure in the comments or comment below what you've seen of the double lives, right? Because you know, when it all comes apart, when the wheels start to fall off, how horrible it can be, right? that narcissistic injury gets triggered, that narcissistic rage comes flying out. And, you know, they, they hate rejection. That's the worst of it. You know, that's their worst fear. They're very easily slighted. They're actually terrified of abandonment. They'll do anything to keep people around. They're actually very, very deeply insecure people at their, their worst core. They certainly don't want people to see their flaws and their shortcomings. They want people to see them as special. I mean, that's their, the double lives that they, that they lead. And so that's why they need these double lives because they, they really are at their core. They feel very awful about themselves. I often think of it as like the wizard of Oz, right? So, you know, like the, the little man behind the curtain, 